because our guest speaker is, he's just really, a, he's phenomenal. I've spent the weekend with him and just getting to have conversations with him and having at our men's meeting last night and this morning in our services. And most, a lot of you are already here, so I'm not going to take long here. I'm going to let him get up here and share with us. But I will give him his, uh, a proper introduction here. Robert Hodgkin is, the, is a speaker, author, and minister. He's the founder of Men on the Front Lines and Robert Hodgkin Ministries. He serves as one of the core leaders of Patricia King Ministries. He hosts a weekly Heroes Arise broadcast. He co-hosts the show Propel with Patricia King and is a regular guest and co-host of Supernatural Life on God TV. He fervently believes that every Christian is a miracle-working explosion of the kingdom waiting to happen. And I just, I just like reading that line. He believes that us, that we, are a miracle-working explosion just waiting to happen. So are you ready for tonight? All right, Robert, come on up. Let's welcome Robert Hodgkin. Bless you all. Thank you so much. While you're standing, let's give one more round of applause to the one who makes this a miracle working explosion. Jesus! Lord, we thank you that we get to gather together again in your presence, in your name. I thank you, Lord, that your plans tonight are to encourage us and equip us, to empower us to enlighten us, to ignite us. And Lord, I thank you that you speak to every single person here tonight. You can use my voice or you can do it even better and simply speak directly to their heart through your Holy Spirit. But God, I ask when we leave here tonight, we'll have an even greater revelation, not only of who you are, but who we are in you, with you, and for you. We'll have an even greater understanding that you've given us everything we need to be your dominion stewards in the earth, to be your kingdom come conduit to express you and represent you and represent you to everyone and every aspect of creation everywhere we go. Lord, we thank you that we do it all in your power, by your spirit, 100% to your glory. And in your mighty name, Jesus, we give you glory, honor, and praise. And everyone says, Amen. Thank you all. Please be seated. I should have said that first. Sometimes when I pray, I can go on. Sometimes when I preach, I can go on. Um, um, I'll try to pay attention to the time tonight. I know it's a Sunday night. I know many of you have already been with us for one service today. Thank you so much for coming out for another. I, was, I had a wonderful lunch with some dear new friends. We had some very interesting conversation. I came back to the house for a little bit and thought, well, maybe I'll rest for a second. But then I decided, no, I'm going to call my wife. And we got to talking, and I was sharing with her some of the conversation. She's like, oh, you're with your tribe, honey. I was like, yeah, we got, it. We got into the weird, wonderful parts of the gospel and who Jesus is and what he's open for us. It was great. So... Um, I was telling her, you know, yeah, I've, I've been an itinerant minister for, hard to believe, 18 years now. Um, I got saved at, uh, at about 39 years of age, and um, the God that I'd mocked and made fun of for almost four decades showed up outside my cabin in the woods one day and declared to me, I refuse not to love you. And through that visitation and another visitation the next day, I got wrecked for Jesus, asked him into my heart. He didn't hesitate one moment and he had every reason to. He had four decades of reasons to hesitate or say no or say it was for everybody but you. You are really a handful. Um, but he didn't. He came flooding into my heart. I've never been the same. Within a year, he called me into full-time ministry. You could not find somebody less qualified or less gifted for it. I was the kid in school when it was time for oral reports in elementary school. I would hold the thermometer to the light bulb on the, the lamp next to my room so it looked like I had a fever because I did not want to go to school on oral report days. I was the kid whose knees sh shook, my hands shook, my throat would tighten up. I, I was so terrified of public speaking. And then when the Lord called me into full-time ministry, he said, I'm going to have you preach around the world. I'm like, you may want to rethink that. 
but he knows what he's doing, especially when I don't. And um, all of that's to say I've now, in the last 18 years, I think I've been to 39 nations, um, um, seen God show up in powerful and profound ways, in many ways just been blown away by what he's done, even though he promises he'll do it, and we shouldn't be surprised, but sometimes I still am. But with that and all the wonderful ministries and missionaries and, and, and churches I've worked with all over the world, every once in a while, every place you go, it's a blessing to serve and pour out. Every once in a while, you come to a place that is so special. You're so aware of the gift and blessing it is to be able to minister in that atmosphere that that church family has created that um, um, uh, you just have to say thank you. And that's what I wanted to start tonight with. Thank you. This is an amazing church. I was visiting with friends um, before the service and I said, you know, I would say easily this church, this atmosphere, you people, top 10 of anywhere I've ever been all around the world. What you've established, what you've carved out, your atmosphere, your love for each other, your sense of community is rare and wonderful. This is a manger that God can and will birth things from. I know you know that. I know it's called Seattle Revival Center for a reason. I know you know how blessed you are with Darren Stott uh, leading things up. But I also want to say as much as I love Darren, and I do, and we've known each other and worked together for years, even though this is my first time out here with you all, he and I have done things and worked together and done a bunch of media together for years. He's one of my favorite people. I can't not be happy when I'm around Darren Stott. I can't not be fired up. I can't not be expectant. I can't not think that there's no power, principality, or giant that my God can't tear down if we have believers like Darren Stott in the world. But you all walk in that same thing. And it's rare and it's wonderful. And I've been incredibly blessed with, it's hard to believe I've only been here for less than two days or about, about 48 hours around now. Um, but I, I wanted to honor you and I wanted to thank you and I wanted to tell you that you're brilliant and you're special and those aren't just uh, uh, empty uh, word adjectives. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. It's been a privilege to be here with you. I usually love to go and serve and then look forward to going home. I am looking forward to going home because I miss my wife and family, but there's a part of me that doesn't want to leave a place this special. Thank you for what you've created for Jesus. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to give a couple things away before we get into tonight's uh, topic. Um, this is a teaching of mine called Resurrection Power. I thought it was an apt thing for Palm Sunday coming into Easter Sunday. I was praying into an Easter message for our church uh, a couple years ago. And uh, the Lord started to reveal to me um, about resurrection power and the place of resurrection. And when I was studying it out in scripture, um, uh, he showed me eight scriptural keys on how we can enter into the place of resurrection to see resurrection power ignited in our life and operate as real revivalists, where you know what revival means to bring back to life. Whether it's the raising of the dead, whether it's the raising of dead dreams, dead hope, dead faith. We need to operate in resurrection power. It's part of our mandate, and this teaching will help you do that. Yes, ma'am, for you. I'm sorry if I, if I jump down. There you go. You're so welcome. This is one of my favorite teachings that I've ever been able to do, and it started in a hotel room in Singapore. I was getting ready for a meeting, and I had just finished up uh, showering and getting cleaned up. I walked out into the main part of the hotel room, and all of a sudden, the presence of the Lord manifested. I didn't see him, but the presence manifested. I felt him, and almost audibly, he declared to me, tell my church I am the Alpha and the Omega. And so I sat down on the bed at the foot of the bed where I was and I, I looked at where I could sense he was in the spirit, the presence was manifesting. And I said, I think we know that, Lord. 
And he says, no, my church knows, that, uh, that knows me as Alpha and knows me as Omega, but I don't want them to know that I was the Alpha and I'll be the Omega. I want them, and all of a sudden, the presence manifested more, and he, what he said was, I want them to know I'm the Alpha and the Omega, and he clapped his hands together like that, and when he did, something went into me that I unpacked with him for the next year. It was all about the present tense power of the great I am. And he showed me things in scripture and spoke to me things about who he truly was and that there's no such thing of anything of God we've ever experienced that's ever in our past. There's no such thing of anything we desire of God that's, 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 that we have to wait for. He is only present tense because he is the great I am, which means he is always great, he is always present, and he is only present tense. So we started to teach me about how to access his I amness, the present tense power of the I am, while being a steward of space and time. Because that's the challenge. He has placed us inside of space and time to steward it. So we are here experiencing space and time, but we are connected to his I amness, to the eternal realm that is only present tense. And ooh, I could do this all night. I love this. And there's not a lot of places you can go deep into this stuff. But that's what this teaching is all about. I'm no expert, I'm still learning, but I love this teaching. And I teach a lot into this in our glory school, which is our core discipleship training school. And the thing I always tell everybody is when we lean into this, it has nothing to do with esoteric knowledge where we get to go, I know something you don't know. Because you know, sometimes with some of the more esoteric and mystical aspects of the kingdom, pride can get in because we're thinking, wow, I have this revelation of a depth of God that not everybody gets. Well, that's not what this is about at all. It has nothing to do with esoteric knowledge. It has everything to do with what we're going to talk about tonight. How do we access what we already have in Christ Jesus, but haven't fully seen yet here in this realm? That's what that's all about. And then one last teaching I want to give away. Has anybody experienced a storm in their life in the last three years? <laughs> yes. Well, you know what's wonderful is um, God has given us the ability in him, with him, and for him to silence every storm. Very quickly, I know you all know this, but just to build your faith and then we'll give this away. You know, when there was the storm, when Jesus said to the disciples, we're going to go to the other side and do some ministry, they were all excited. They got in the boat. They started going. Um, Jesus was so at peace with it all. He goes to sleep. A storm kicks up. And what do the, the, the disciples say? They come running to him and say, do you not care that we are drowning? Help. And he gets up and he silences the storm. And he turns to them and he says, oh, ye of little faith. Now, sometimes we can misunderstand that and think he's saying, why don't you have any faith in me? They had total faith in him. They came running to him, asking for help. They knew he could help. What he was saying was, do you not yet have faith in all that I've been teaching you? You can deal with these storms. I'll always be in the boat, or if I'm not in the boat, I'll walk on the water and get in the boat. I'm always here for you. But what I want is for you to get that I'm actually discipling you in how to do all of this. He meant it when he said, the works that he did, we will do also. If he silenced a storm, we can silence a storm. In his power, by his authority, 100% to his glory. But we can do it because that's what we're here for. I have seen literal storm silenced. I have seen powers and principalities presenting themselves over a worship festival in Mongolia when he told me how to do it. See those things split down the middle and go to the horizons. I have seen storms in my family silence, but all from this place of learning and relearning and learning some more and growing some more in how to silence every single storm because we have the victory and this is about how to legislate and exercise execute the victory and see those storm silence. So who is a storm? That, oh, it's all yours. That is a woman who will silence every storm. I love it. That was a faith shout. And I declare the shift is coming to you, your household, and your bloodline now in Jesus Christ. And the revelation of the authority that you have in Christ, even before you touch this teaching... 
even before you touch the teaching or listen to the teaching, I release into you everything the Lord has taught me, and enough is enough. You're right. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'll give a copy of this book away by the end of tonight, but I need it for a little bit here. Um, when Darren and I, well, we didn't speak. Um, Darren tends to, um, what do you call it? He texts me, but with his voice. I'm obviously older than Darren. Um, I love it. It's so easy. It's a dangerous thing. My wife has warned me, honey, don't do that. Because she knows me. I'll talk and talk and talk and talk. She's like, just text me a sentence, please. But he sent a, a series of voice texts and was, and was asking, you know, could I come? Could I do this? Could I do that? And then he said, bro, don't you love Darren's bro? There is nothing that makes you feel more connected and a part of something than when Darren Stott says, bro, <laughs> bro, Sunday night, would you do something from one of your books? Would you do a teaching from one of your books? So that's what he asked me to do. That's what I'm going to do. I prayed about which book, and I felt to do it on winning the battle for your mind, will, and emotions. I forgot my bottle of water. Um, winning the, oh, thank you. Yeah, probably. <laughs> it's wet. It'll work. This is actually a book I wrote several years ago, but in God's wisdom and prescience, it applies so much to the season that we're in. And I've got a little bit of a teaching that barely touches on the book, but I want to read a little bit. I want to give you a little bit of an overview and introduction. But what I want to start with is a question. Have you ever cried out some variation of, God, I must have more of you? Have you ever cried out anything like, God, I'm hungry for more of you? This book is the result of almost a dozen years of being personally mentored by the Holy Spirit through one of the greatest challenges I ever faced, but learning how to live in and inhabit the victory and more of God no matter how things look or feel. Because my journey on this really started when as a newer Christian, as a newer minister, I was seeing all sorts of stuff happening. I, got to, I was raised up in ministry by Patricia King, an incredible woman of God. Her husband, Ron, you may not know as well, but to this day, he's still, I think, the greatest man of God I've ever known because of how he inhabits all that he is and all that he was called to in the Lord. I love Ron with all my heart. Um, but I was serving with these champions, these generals, these giants, and seeing amazing things happen. And as a new minister, a new believer, really, I would be crying out, God, I want more of you. God, I must see more of you. God, I must have more of you. And one day, I thought I was really praying like these powerful, passionate prayers. Like I thought, wow, I'm praying good, baby. God's hearing me. I must have more. I'm hungry for more. And the still small voice of the Lord says, no. What do you mean, no? Your prayer is theologically inaccurate. What do you mean, theologically inaccurate? I can't give you more. I've given you everything. So we have this heart-to-heart -heart conversation, and you already know how it goes. What I love about the Lord, though, is so I'm thinking, oh, I blew it. I'm praying theologically inaccurate prayers. I've been bad. And the Lord said, it's theologically inaccurate, but I love the prayer. I love when my people cry out for more. You know why you so passionately cry out for more? And I thought, because I want more, but we've covered that. That wasn't right. <laughs> he said, the reason you're so passionate, the reason my people, my remnant are so passionate is because they know they have the fullness. Their born-again spirit knows I have given you everything. I hold nothing back. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has been given unto you. Uh, Ephesians 1.3. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has been given unto you, and everything pertaining to life and godliness is yours in Christ Jesus. I butchered 2 Peter 1.3, but that's the gist of it. 
And he said, you know, the reason you're so uh, passionate is because you know you have it. And I love this cry because what you're cr really crying out for is, God, I must see more of what I have. That's, we know it's ours. That's why we want to see it. That's why we're hungry for it. So the Lord took me on this journey of mentoring. I went through a dozen years of increasingly mysterious and debilitating health challenges. For over 10 of those years, no doctor anywhere in the world could figure out what was going on with me or why I was quite literally withering away. I'm 6'3", 190 pounds. At one point, I was down to 145 pounds. I was so weak and so sick, I couldn't stand up in a shower. I'd have to sit. On the days I had the strength to get to the shower, I'd turn it on, immediately sit down, and it would take me at least 10 minutes to bathe, just the strength to, to lift up my arms. Um, if I ever, when, when I walk to the, the, in Arizona, do you guys have um, post boxes or your mailboxes on your house here? You do, okay. Arizona is the first place I've ever lived with post boxes. I've always had mailboxes on my house. But when I would walk to the post box, that would just, that, just a simple stroll to the post box would put me in bed for anywhere from three days to three weeks. And no one could figure out why. I had been blessed to serve in Eastern Europe for a, a significant part of this journey. And in that time, I got to minister to the homeless, the drug addicted, but it was also blessed to minister to some of the leaders of parliament and the European Union. I had a lot of favor with them. And um, one, one, two dear friends that were very high up leaders in that government were kind enough. They had multiple holdings and, and homes and they let me stay in one of their apartments and because it was near the lab, near the hospital, and near the doctor that was the specialist they set me up with. But like, so leader, the leaders who were concerned about me, global leaders were sending me to their doctor because they saw me and I was withering away. Doctors of that level couldn't figure out what was going on with me. And I got sicker and sicker, weaker and weaker. And in the midst of that, I started crying out to God. And I remember at one point I was at this one clinic overseas going through a series of experimental treatments uh, six days a week for eight to 10 hours a day. I was going through experimental treatments and they'd pump me full of stuff and then they'd put me in a hyperbaric chamber. Do you know what that is? I didn't till I was there. So it's like this, I don't know what you'd call it, sealed tube. It's probably what toothpaste feels like. I'd go inside this cylindrical tube where it wasn't, I, I, could, I could sort of sit up, but I couldn't even sit fully up. And after they pumped me full of all these experimental treatments, they'd put me in there, and it's like a, a hyper-oxygenated pressure cooker. So it's hyper-oxygenated, and then, I wish my engineer father was here, he could explain it, I don't pretend to understand it. But the PSI is turned way up, and the theory is between the hyper-oxygenization and the increased atmospheric pressure, whatever they had put in me would be accelerated and increased in, in how it worked. But one thing I learned, God loves hyperbaric chambers. Because I wasn't even allowed to take my iPod in there. This was overseas, and most of the nursing staff, the doctors spoke very good English. I spoke only English. Unfortunately, I'm a typical American. I can, I can stumble my way through some Thai, some Latvian, um, uh, an embarrassing little amount of Korean, considering I married into a Korean family. Um, and and my, my wonderful pastor of our church, Francisco, tells me, despite what I think and declare, my Spanish is terrible. So um, I don't really speak other languages that well. The doctors did, the nurses did a little bit, but we had a communication issue and all I could tell is that they were concerned because they weren't really sure back then exactly how iPods worked and I certainly didn't know. They didn't know if there was the potential from a spark while it was playing because if that happened, I'd turn into Johnny Storm the Human Torch inside the chamber. So I wasn't even allowed to take that in there for worship music. So I would be in there for one to two hours just being pressure cooked, you know, like a, 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 a I don't know, a chicken or a, a Thanksgiving turkey. And, um, but in total, with nothing to do, and I'd try to sleep, but most of the time it was hard to sleep even in a bed because the way my eyes would burn with fever. But the Lord would meet me in there. And one day I remember 
He, his presence was so strong. And one day, you'd think I'd just be like Joshua basking in the descended cloud. And I did sometimes, but one day, I kind of had a hissy fit. I started talking to God in the midst of this visitation, and I said, Lord, when will I see greater manifestations of your power? I've prayed, and I've prayed, and I've prayed. And he spoke so clearly to me. He said, you and my people will see greater manifestations of my power when you start taking greater responsibility over your mind, will, and emotions. And I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, you have not stewarded the realm of your soul said, where have I not stewarded the realm of my soul? said, you have given over to self-pity. And this is what I said to the Lord. Well, haven't you noticed my circumstances? They're kind of pitiful. <laughs> I'm arguing with God why self-pity is a rational response to what's going on. And as I'm doing it, all of a sudden I go, oh, I have given over to self-pity. And the Lord said, I will set you free, but I need to take you on a journey. And over the next Close to a decade, he mentored me on and off, but he would come to me, usually at my lowest moments, and teach me kingdom truths and teach me how to live inside of the more that I'd been crying out for and started to realize I already had. And he taught me the difference between having it and seeing it. And then he taught me how to see it made manifest no matter what I was feeling in any given moment. Winning the battle for your mind, will, and emotions is all about how to live in the victory and the more of God that we have been crying out for because we already have it. Even though we haven't quite seen all of it yet, but we do have it and how that shifts everything. And he started to teach me about the power of the mind, the supernatural divine power of the mind, the supernatural divine power of our will, the supernatural divine power of our emotions, and then the, in all of that, the supernatural and divine power of the words that we speak. I serve in a very prophetic ministry. I thought I had a really good understanding on the power of our words, but he took me even deeper into the power of the words. But what really blew me away was the power of the mind, the power of the will, and the, the, there's a whole chapter on each of those, and the power of the emotions. I was a very sensitive little kid. I grew up mostly in the 1970s. I tried as hard as I could to be a tough guy. I tried as hard as I could to be, you know, a guy's guy. And basically what that meant is I ended up having my mouth write a lot of checks my fist couldn't cash. I was not a tough guy. I finally tried to get at peace with being a sensitive kid. I was introverted. Um, my parents discovered with me very early on that sending me, me to my room was not a punishment. It was a great relief. When they would say, go to your room, I think, thank you, God, even though I don't know you yet. Oh, I loved going to my room. I loved being alone. I loved being able to be up there all by myself with my imagination and my G.I. Joes and my stacks of comic books and my Legos. And I would create worlds that made sense to me because I was all alone. As soon as I went out in the world, I didn't fit anywhere. Nothing made sense to me. My mom used to jokingly say, okay, if you don't behave, I'm going to make you go outside and play with the other kids. Be like, Mom, I'll go outside, but I'm going to climb a tree and be by myself. I just didn't get it. I was very sensitive. I didn't know. I didn't grow up around any of this. I didn't know what the prophetic was. I didn't know what being a prophetic feeler was. I didn't know why I would go into certain friends' houses and I'd get uncomfortable and know that the parents had been arguing. I didn't know why I went into my buddy Todd's house, why I would feel rejection until years later I found out that his mother couldn't stand me and didn't want him playing with me. But I could feel it in the atmosphere. I grew up in a household with wonderful parents who did the very best that they could. And the 70s, if, if, you were too, if you're too young to experience the 70s, thank the Lord for that right now. It was a weird time, you know, and, and just like, you know, but God's bigger than all of it. But my parents were involved in the stuff that they were involved in. And, you know, in the midst of that, they were wonderful parents. They took care of me. They fed me. They put clothes on my back. They never, they never abused me in any way. You know, they might have been absent and they, I might not have fit in, but they were wonderful parents and they did the best they could and I'm grateful for them and I love them and I honor them. 
In the midst of that, though, I didn't have anybody there to help me understand why nothing fit and nothing worked. I didn't understand why when my parents would tell me everything's okay, I would know so deeply that there was so much tension and and subtle, quiet storms of anger in my house that I ended up curled up in a ball in my closet in my bedroom. And then one day I remember being on the playground And I don't even remember what happened, but I remember it hurt. And I remember crying. And I remember being made fun of, being told, boys, don't cry. And I made a vow when I was eight years old, I'll never cry again. And I tried so hard to be strong and to be tough and to be what I thought a little boy, a little man was supposed to be. And I just never got it. You know, I told you a little bit about my salvation experience I I rebelled hard because I didn't fit in and because my heart had been hurt so much, I shut my heart down. I became a postmodern nihilistic deconstructionist, which is a whole lot of hoo-ha that means what I look back now and what it really meant was I was so hurt and so disappointed by so much. I was afraid to put faith or belief or hope in anything, but too prideful and arrogant to admit I was afraid, so I became an intellectual bully that not only refused to believe in anything, but anyone who did believe in something, I felt I had to tear down their hope and faith. It was ugly and gross, and I'm grateful Jesus set me free of it. But when he showed up outside my cabin in the woods that day and said, I refuse not to love you, it took me very much by surprise. And I brought before him, I think I told this story at the the earlier service, so I apologize if I repeat this part. But I had a conversation with him heart to heart, and I'm not really sure how long it lasted because it was like a dome of heaven had been set down around me, and there was this supernatural hush and silence, and there was only present tense. It's the best way I can describe it, and it fails horribly. But so in this moment, however long it lasted, I had this very long, instantaneous conversation conversation with the Lord, where when he said, I refuse not to love you, I brought before him heart to heart every wicked, arrogant, mean, selfish, hurtful, hateful thing I'd ever done. And there was an incredibly long list because I was a wounded, mean man. And everything he responded to, I refuse not to love you. I'd never experienced anything like that. For the first time in my whole life, I felt like I fit in. For the first time in my whole life, I felt loved and accepted, weirdness and warts and oddities and all. I had been a searcher for most of my adult life. I'd done, I'd looked in the New Age movement, the human potential movement. Are there children in here? If there's any kids in here, the next thing I'm gonna say is, is something you never wanna do because it's a horrible trap. I, use, I, I, I searched through hallucinogenic drugs. I searched in every way you could search, almost. I did graduate work at the Jung Institute. So by that evening, I knew something real had happened But when this whole moment passed, I got up out of the snowbank I was sitting in outside my cabin. I realized I was just in boots, jeans, and a sweatshirt, and that my butt was getting wet and cold because I was sitting in a snowbank. And all of a sudden, I was aware of the passage of time again. I went into my cabin. I knew something real had happened, but because of everything I'd seen and everything I'd experienced in all the false, empty places I'd searched, I had simply convinced myself that night something real happened, but it's just the universe expressing itself or that kind of whatever. The next day, I'm in my cabin. I get a phone call, and it's, I won't go into all the details, but it was a very difficult phone call. I slammed the phone down, and I had trained myself, as you can imagine, over the years to not feel my feelings and to not think my thoughts. So I immediately tried to distract myself. I decided I was going to take it all out on the dishes in my sink, but I lived alone in a cabin in the woods. There was a spoon, a cup, and a bowl. It took me all of 30 seconds to wash the dishes, and I'm still trying to push the thoughts away, push the feelings away, push the fear away, push the pain away. 
So I decide, I know, I'm going to turn the stereo on and I'm going to turn it up loud. I'm in the middle of the woods. My closest neighbor is 10 acres away, down the slope, across the valley, can barely see them. I can turn the music up loud. I get two steps towards the stereo and physically feel a jolt of electricity hit me in the belly and felt, didn't see, but felt something tangible pop out of my mouth. I fell to my knees and I began to weep uncontrollably for almost three hours. When I was 28 years old and I was working in um, uh, uh, the creative side of, of large brand, big budget, high pressure advertising, creating TV commercials and print ads and radio spots, I had a, I, don't, I can't remember what they called it, but basically a, a little breakdown. They had a technical term for it, but it was the only time since I was eight years old when I couldn't make myself stop crying. I had a, basically a massive panic and anxiety attack. I started crying. I couldn't feel my legs. I couldn't feel the back of my head. My hands were trembling and I couldn't stop it. And I sat down in one of the chairs in my office and I couldn't stop crying. It's the only experience I had with uncontrollable tears since I was eight years old. So now here I am, a cabin in the woods of northwest Montana, tiny little cabin, way up in the, in the foothills of the Rockies. And I mean, it's winter, and I'm sobbing uncontrollably. And all I can think in my head is I'm having a breakdown, and this is going to be like that scene in Jeremiah Johnson where they find the old um, um, wilderness guy in the spring, frozen in the woods, holding on to his rifle. I think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die here. I'm going to have a meltdown. I'm not going to be able to stop crying. I'm going to be frozen to the floor of my kitchen with my snot and tears. I don't know what's going on. This is bad. But all of a sudden, I noticed the more I cried, the freer I felt. And after almost three hours, if I recall the timing, I came up off the floor a total mess, a puddle of tears, a trail of snot. I came up off the floor, still on my knees. I took a deep breath like a man coming out from underwater after swimming across a, a pool. And I went, <gasps> took this deep breath. And much to my surprise, the words that came out of my mouth were, Jesus, if you're as real as you felt in the woods yesterday, I need your help. I can't do this anymore. I want you. I want you. I want you. He came flooding into my heart and nothing has been the same since. I have been well-loved, completely accepted, and very, very, very lovingly disciplined for almost 20 years now. And oh, one thing, one thing the Lord showed me um, later was that thing when he blasted me with, I don't know if it was an angel with a cattle prod, I don't know what it was, but that, that jolt of electricity that hit me and I felt that thing pop out of my mouth. After I was processing through some things with him, I'd lay in my hammock between the tall tamarack pines and we'd have these conversations. He made his presence and his reality and his lordship and kingship and one true godship so real to me my first few months that every single thing I'd experienced that was a false shadow of him completely fell away. And I would sit with him and talk with him and the, the presence would come and he'd speak to my heart, not audibly, but incredibly clearly. And one night I was in my hammock swaying back and forth, listening to the wind in the tamarack pines. And we were having this conversation and I said, Lord, what was that thing that popped out of my mouth? He said, it was the oath you made when you were eight years old. When that popped out of your mouth, 30 years of tears came flooding out of you over the next three hours. And he said, I'm not done yet because you've shut down your emotions for three decades. And I want to teach you how to feel the kingdom way. I'm still learning. But he started to mentor me in the supernatural power of our emotions because most of us, especially if we're feelers, and I'm still learning this. Like, I'll go into cities and nations, and often the way I discern the atmosphere and what needs to be dealt with is I feel it. And you know, if you're a feeler, you feel. Which means if there's a stronghold of depression in the city, you don't simply go, I discern that there's depression here. You go, I really feel depressed. But you realize, wait, that's not who I am. I was clinically depressed before I met Jesus. He completely set me free of it. 
So if I feel depression, I know it's not me. I know I'm discerning an atmosphere, but I'm feeling it. So the Lord was teaching me how to feel non-kingdom, undivine uh, emotions, but rise up above them, deal with them in the spirit, but all from the place of, because I had, I'm, I'm like a one or a zero. I'm a binary dude. I'm off or on. I'm like super intense emotional communicator or I'm sitting by myself quietly in a room staring at my lap thinking, ah. So the Lord was showing me like the, the, the way to unlock the supernatural power of your emotions is not feel negative ones or shut them down. And so for almost 20 years now, he's been teaching me about the supernatural power of emotions. And I'm not going to teach into that chapter tonight, but I felt to share that because with everything going on in our world and our city and our state, there are many, many people who are real prophetic feelers and you don't even realize that's why you're frustrated and angry all the time. Because there's so much frustration and anger and rancor and, and, and discouragement in the atmosphere in our nation that you're just thinking, well, I'm super discouraged. No, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And it's okay that you're feeling that. It's glorious that you're feeling that, but you're feeling it to discern it. And God wants to teach the fe feeling is so powerful. I tell a story in the book. I don't think I have time to go into it tonight because I actually have to get to the teaching. We're not even there yet. Um, <laughs> But when God started to mentor me in how to unlock my heart to, to get beyond fear and frustration and discouragement at one of my very, okay, is it okay if I tell the story? Okay. So we may not get to the teaching, but we'll still talk about the book the way Darren asked me to. Yeah, I'd love to come back. I love you guys. Um, so I told you that there was this long health battle. And there's a couple things I want to, I want to, I want to encourage you because I know you're all in battles. And if you're not in a battle, you'll be in a battle. And if you've just come out of a battle, you will have a time of rest, but you'll have another battle because we're God's plan for the hour. We're his champion and his warriors. We are not to be met like the army of Israel and cower on the sidelines when the giants are parading in the land, mocking God's will, ways, and people. We are to be like King David who deals with the giants in the land. Little but very important bunny trail I'd like to point out, and I'm sharing this with you because I know what great champions you are, and you'll help establish this because I know you're not doing this. But notice that David does not... Murmur, complain, attack, or malign the army of Israel. He does not get on Facebook and tell them everything they're doing wrong. And how he is the right response and the right theology and everyone else is wrong. He simply shows up in who he, know he, who, who he knows he is, knowing God is with him, and he deals with the giant in the land. If we as a body of Christ, I'm not talking to the amazing believing believers of SRC, but if we can help establish a, a culture in the body of Christ where we stop taking energy to attack one another and use a fraction of that to tear down the things of the enemy, we'll see revival and reformation in our nation in a year. All right, so... I'm at my, one of my very lowest points, like as discouraged, as sick, as weak as I could be. It was one of those days where all I could do was lay on the couch, not even have my eyes open very much because the way they burned with fever, I got these weird fever rings around my eyes all the time and it was easier just to lay with my head back and my eyes closed. I'm doing that, laying on the couch and the, the sliding glass door to our patio is behind my head. And as I'm laying there, just trying not to, you know, be sick, I hear this thump, and something hit behind me with this thump, and I rallied my strength, I lifted myself up on one elbow, turned back to see the sliding glass door, and there was this like, stain isn't the right word, schmear is the right word, schmear on the sliding glass door, and I'm thinking, what the heck, man? And then as I'm lowering myself back down, because I don't have the strength or energy to care that much about it, I see 
on the ground, a bird. And now I realized it had obviously flown into the glass door because it was the time of day, the way the light hit. It looked probably like he could fly through, but he smashed in to the door really hard, obviously, and was on the ground. I just got a glimpse of him. I didn't see the details of it yet, but I'm thinking, there's a dead bird on the patio. What does one do with a dead bird? And I'm thinking, we've got cats in this neighborhood. I don't want them to scavenge the bird. That's just gross. But I don't know what to do about it. And so then I think, you know, I think we have a shovel somewhere. Later, I'll get the strength to find the shovel, and then I'll rest, and then I'll get the strength to scoop up the bird and the shovel, and then I'll take the bird and put it in the trash can and go back to bed. So while I'm laying there thinking, what a good plan. The Lord speaks to me clearly. Now, I want to be, I want to be clear about this because I never want to create any kind of false impression. It was not an audible voice. It was a clear, still small voice. Sometimes when you hear people with microphones, you make the mistake of thinking, wow, they have a microphone. They must be special. No, only Jesus is special. You know, and we say things like, I heard the Lord say, if, if we're not careful, we can create the impression of, we're just walking around hearing God's voice like I'm, you're hearing my voice. I know some people that kind of walk in that, but I'm blessed, and I mean it, to operate mostly in the still small voice because it's the place of intimacy. I love that God whispers to my heart most of the time. When I come home from an overseas trip and I've been gone for three weeks, I may step through the door and yell, honey, I'm home, but when I see you, Rhea, I go up to her, I pull her in my arms, I hug her tight, and I say, oh, baby, I missed you. The still small voice is the declaration of love and intimacy. God will shout at me when he needs to, I know for a fact, because he's needed to, and he has. But most of the time, it's the still, small voice. That's what I mean, but it was very clear. And as I'm coming up with my plan, the Lord speaks to me clearly to my heart and says, go and pray for the bird. I'm thinking, why? <laughs> go and pray for the bird. You're sovereign, you do it. If you haven't noticed, I'm dealing with a lot here. And I'm really in this place. I'm wrestling with this place. And again and again and again, go and pray for the bird. Go and pray for the bird. One thing the Lord knows is I love him very much. And if we love him, we'll obey his word. Not out of performance, not out of religious pressure, but out of depths of relationship. We, we obey him if we love him, but we love him because he first loved us. I know the word of my father is true and transformative. Whether it's the word in the Bible or something, I know that I know that I know he's, he's speaking to me. He is not a carrot dangling God. He is not a God that makes us jump through hoops. But he is a brilliant God who knows how to lead, even his son who is sometimes a petulant brat. So I'm laying on the couch being a petulant brat. You do it. Have you not noticed what I'm dealing with? Pray for the birds. I'm like, finally, okay, I will. So I kind of roll myself off the couch. I get up. I kind of walk over to the sliding glass door, and I immediately sit back down. I extend my hand towards the glass door, and I start to pray. And the Lord says, open the door and pray for the bird. And I said to him, you're a big God. Whatever you can do on that side of the glass you can do on this side of the glass. I'm, I'm serious. I know it sounds funny, but this is the conversation I'm having in my heart with the Lord. So open the door and I said, Lord, I seem to remember somewhere from my childhood in the 1970 suburbs that birds can carry like mites and fleas and ticks. And like the last thing I need is parasites jumping off that dead bird onto me. I've already am dealing with enough. I don't need some random bird flu. You can do it from this side of the glass. <laughs> Open the door and pray for the bird. I sat there for an embarrassing length of time, really wrestling with this. I mean, this bird is dead, because now I see it clearly. Its head is turned around. Its neck is at a weird angle. It might as well have had those cartoon little crosses in its eyes. This bird was like um, um, Lazarus fourth day dead. It was dead. To paraphrase Monty Python, it's a dead bird. Sorry if you're not a Monty Python fan. Very funny old sketch. All right, back to God. That's what we're here for. 
So I'm wrestling, and I'm like, finally, okay, I'll do it. So I open the door, slide it out, get up, take a couple steps, sit back down onto, or actually sit kind of down on my knees, and I put my hand, like, over the bird, but I'm leaning back, and I'm, like, looking for, I am, I'm looking for things that might be jumping off the bird, looking for a new host. And I start to pray. I have no idea what I'm praying. I'm totally in my head. I'm like ready to swat bugs. And the Lord says, pick up the bird. Clear clear as an inner voice bell. Clearly. I know it was him because I had no interest in that and was thinking anything but that. Pick up the bird. And all of a sudden I think, all right, I'm already in the hot zone. Might as well just go for it. So I pick the bird up with my left hand. And I'm still kind of leaning back. And the bird says, lay hands on the bird. And I'm thinking, put your finger on the bird. So I take my index finger and I touch the bird. And within a second, my heart explodes with the love of the creator for this aspect of his creation. That's the only way I can describe it. I didn't think about what I prayed. I didn't think about parasites. I didn't think about bugs. I didn't think about being sick and weak. I didn't think about hesitation or fear. All I could do, I went from touching the bird. I didn't lay finger on it. All of a sudden, I've got two fingers, and I am stroking the bird tenderly while crying, saying, God loves you so much. God loves you so much. God loves you so much. All I could feel was the creator's heart for this aspect of creation that was broken and as I'm saying God loves you so much God loves you so much the weirdest thing happened the head comes around it jumps out of my hand it goes flying off and I'm like God do you even raise animals from the dead is that biblical I sat back and I just went wow God is so good you cannot be more wrapped up in your own selfish junk than I was on the couch that day and the Lord taught me in that moment that he is more than willing to meet us exactly where we are and lead us step by step by step into what he has for us and I look back on that and realize he was so loving so patient so kind so gentle so firm that he led me off the couch he led me a couple steps across the floor he led me from this side of the glass to that side of the glass he led me from hesitation and fear into simply leaning into his heart and connecting with the heart of the father in love and I have now seen the dead raised three times But through God's leading, I had to win the battle for my mind, will, and emotions. And let me focus on this, and then we'll wrap up, and I'll pray for you. But I actually want to teach into this a little bit. As you know, the mind, will, and emotions are what make up the soul realm. And we're three-part beings, right? Body, soul, and spirit. And then our soul is three realms, mind, will, and emotions, or thoughts, feelings, and choices, or decisions. That's what our will does. The will is the place of volition. The will is the realm of the soul where we make our decisions and we choose. We choose what we're going to believe. We choose what we're going to do. We choose what feelings we're going to entertain. We choose what thoughts we're going to ponder. Every attack of the enemy is ultimately an attack on the soul. Because the enemy wants you to make the mistake God warns us of in, warns us of in Romans 1.25. The enemy wants to sucker and trick you into exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And I'm sure like me, you're thinking, I'd never do that. I love God. I trust God. His word is true. I totally feel you. I can't tell you the number of times God had to show me, you've exchanged my truth for a lie. Not my salvation. I was saved. I was going to heaven. But here's how the enemy likes to do it, and then we'll come back to the whole power of the will. The enemy's favorite tactic... Oh, wait, let me emphasize this again. I said something I need to unpack a little bit. 
Every attack of the enemy is ultimately an attack on your soul. Because whether it's a, a, a prodigal attack, he'll never come back to the Lord. Whether it's a financial attack, I'll never have enough. Whether it's a health attack, will I ever be well? If it's a relationship attack, will my wife and I ever get along again? Whatever the attack is, it can manifest against the body. It can manifest against the family. It can manifest against relationships. It can manifest against provision. But ultimately, it's an attack on the soul because what the enemy wants you to do is choose to believe that those cir current circumstances or that past history is your portion. That God is not there, God does not care, and his promises in certain areas are not for you. Because the enemy knows God will never turn from us and his promises will never be anything but yes and amen. But he knows the power of our mind, will, and emotions better than we do. And he knows if we'll entertain raka thoughts. You know, Jesus says, oh, Lord, forgive me because I don't have it in front of me. And you know, I'm, I, I often cite incorrectly, so give me some grace. But he basically says in the Old Testament, it was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. If you committed murder, you were to be slain. My, I'm here to raise the bar. And I'm here to tell you in the New Testament, completely loved, totally accepted, utterly transformed. But in that, the bar is raised, and if you even raka a brother, you have committed murder. That word raka, one of the best translations of it is stupid or idiot. So if you think towards a politician or the dude who cut you off in traffic, idiot! You've just rocked them. You've just committed murder in the spirit. How do I know? God has corrected me many times. Here's the good news. The blood of Jesus Christ works. So when we realize it, we can say, oh, God, I'm sorry. I was entertaining negative, hateful thoughts. I entertained anger and bitterness and fear and offense, and I vented it. And Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm working for the wrong team right now. But thank you that your blood works. I plead the blood of Jesus over those thoughts I command them to fall to the ground harmless and ineffective, and now I do what you instructed me to do. I take authority over every thought and bring it into captivity and alignment with the truth in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you were against what that politician stands for, but you're for him or her. And I shall pray for him or her to come into a saving knowledge of who you are and what you've done and what you created them for while taking a stand in the spirit and the natural against any unrighteousness they work for. That's winning the battle for your mind, will, and emotions about the thoughts you entertain. So, um, um, the, but the enemy likes to point to our current circumstances and say, look at that. Look at how it's always been. Look at how it is now. J you should be afraid it's always going to be that way. You need to exchange the truth of God for a lie because let's get face it. It's not, it, it's not true. How many times have you been declaring that you're healed by his stripes? Dude, you've been sick for 12 years. Give it up. He did this in the garden. He pointed, he said, did God really say? Is that really true? Is that true for you? Did he really say you can't eat any of this? No, no, no. We can actually eat everything except that one tree. That looks like the best. Why is he keeping the best one from you? You know, if you eat that, you'll be just like him. You'll know good and evil. You'll be just like him. He doesn't care about you. Doesn't it look good? And he's, yeah, it looks delicious. It says that it appealed to her flesh. It'll make you wise. Don't you want to be wise? Yeah, I do want to be wise. It appealed to her soul. What was the lie? Two huge lies here. Look at the current circumstance. God says you can't have that. God's keeping something from you. It's a lie. God wasn't keeping anything from them. He was keeping them from harm. The other lie was, if you eat it, you'll know the difference between good and evil. You'll be just like him. Lie. They were already made in his image. They already knew good or evil because God told them. What he was suckering them into is choosing to be Lord of their own lives. What he was suckering them into is tempting them to think, 
Well, God might say good or evil, but I want to know for me. I want to decide for me. They already knew what was good and evil. God would always tell them. They were already made in his image. When they fell, God did not stop being God. When they were kicked out of the garden, or actually excused themselves from the garden, God was still God, but he was no longer Lord. We use Lord and God as a synonym. As synonym? No, as a synonym, it's not. God is who God is. Lord is who we choose to allow him to be in our lives. When we, cho- we didn't accept Jesus as God and Savior. We accepted him as Lord and Savior. We were saying, you're Lord. I want you as Lord. I want you to rule and reign in my life. I want you to tell me what's right and wrong. Because I know you're not turning me into a robot and you're not controlling and you're not a performance God. I've never felt so loved. I've never felt so accepted. I want your will and ways because I know it's good. Now think about this. So Eve makes that choice. Adam makes that choice. What's the very first battle Jesus wins for us in his earthly ministry? He comes up out of the waters the heavens open, the Holy Spirit descends as a dove, and the Father says, behold, my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased, and Jesus launches out into his earthly ministry. The very first thing that happens is the Holy Spirit, as a new believer all by myself in my cabin, I probably had to read that a half dozen times till I caught that. I thought, that sneaky devil suckering Jesus out into the desert to tempt him. No, the Holy Spirit led him there. Why? Because he was about to win the battle in the desert on our behalf that we lost in the garden. What was the, what, 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 what does the devil do? After 40 days, no food and water, the devil shows up and says, if you are a son, turn those stones to bread. What's going on? The devil realizes 40 days without food and water. This is a paraphrase, but this is what I think happened and it was going on. The devil sidles up to Jesus and says, whoo, 40 days without food and water. You gotta be hungry you got to be thirsty. If you are a son, the best thing we can say is your father is absent and abusive. He's not taking care of you. Do you want me to call Child Protective Services? I'll do it right now. If you are a son, your father's not there for you. He doesn't care for you. He's not providing for you. Turn those stones to bread. We both know you can do it. Decide for yourself what is needed in this moment. It's the battle that Adam and Eve, that we lost in the fall. What does Jesus say? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds in the father's mouth. We know the declared word of God is powerful, but this is especially poignant when we realize what were the last words that had proceeded from the Father's mouth? Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus is saying, I will not allow my current circumstances to impact the revelation of my sonship and the goodness of my father. I will let the revelation of my sonship and the goodness of my father impact my current circumstances. He won that battle for us in the desert. We must win that battle, or I said that poorly. We must step into that victory by stewarding our mind, our will, and our emotions. Because let's get real. When you've been sick for 12 years, when your prodigal still got that needle in his arm after eight years, when the checkbook is still screaming at you, another month with not enough, it's really easy when the devil pokes us and points at our temporary circumstances to think, I don't know what Paul was talking about, light and momentary affliction. This has gone on 12 years, man. But then when we realize, wait a minute, Everything shifted for me. One day when I was wrestling so much and the Lord showed up and he started to mentor me and teach me and disciple me and rabbi me and he said, one of the challenges you face is you're contending for a healing you hope to see one day. And I'm like, darn tootin'. Haven't seen it yet, wanna see it. He said, you're never contending for something you think you, you're never contending for something you hope to see one day. You're contending for a greater manifestation of what you know is yours. I thought, that sounds good, 
but I'm sick. And then this is what he showed me. He said, all right, imagine you had worked and saved and had a million dollars in the bank. I was still doing uh, some work over in Southeast Asia, anti-human trafficking work, and um, we were uh, establishing orphanages and microenterprise trainings for children and young women. And the Lord said, what if you'd scraped together a million dollars, had it in the bank, and we were dreaming together of what you would do and what you would build for the women and children over in Cambodia with a million dollars? Like, that sounds good. Now, what if you went online, because I paid my bills online, what if you go online and you see that your bank balance says zero? Well, I'd call the bank. And what if the bank said, no, Mr. Hodgkin, we're looking at your balance right here, it says zero. I said, well, I don't care how much strength I do or don't have, I'd be over at the manager's office first thing in the morning, sitting at his desk and say, find my million dollars. You lost it, you found it. You find it. He said, exactly. Now, if you'd contend that fiercely for the riches of this world, why didn't you contend that fiercely for what you know you have when it comes to the riches of the kingdom? You were healed 2,000 years ago at the cross. And all of a sudden it shifted. And I realized, wait, I'm not contending for something I hope to see one day. I have it. I'm contending for a greater manifestation of what I know is mine. That began the shift. That's winning the battle of your mind, will, and emotions. Actually, that's when, as of the mind, because of how I thought about things, how I looked at things. Look, I don't believe in denial. I don't believe in ever denying the circumstances you're overcoming. That doesn't work. Jesus never denied sin. He came and dealt with it. Jesus didn't deny sin. When, somebody, when the leper came up to him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me, he didn't say, what are you coming to me for? Don't you have faith that you're already healed? No, the leper knew he had leprosy. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me. I love this translation that I didn't bring with me, the, um, where it says, if you're willing, because most of them say, if you want to, and he says, I want to. I love the one where his answer is, I'm willing. I want to, I'm willing, it's done. When we realize we can come to him and say, Lord, thank you that you've done it. Now teach me, help me learn how to manifest it. It's the same with emotions. I went through a season where I was dealing with a lot of anger. And then what really got me was I saw clearly, it said in the epistles that anger gives a foothold to the enemy. And I thought, I don't wanna do that. So Lord, help me figure out why I'm so angry. One night my wife helped me. She said, honey, just turn off the news apps. And I, I, I have the duh anointing. I went, oh, duh, yeah. I am constantly meditating on all that's wrong as opposed to meditating more and more on what the truth is. God wants me to be aware of what's wrong in the world, but so I can deal with it from the place of truth. So the enemy will point to your current circumstances, but what we have to get is I think I shared this at the second service, but let me go back into it because it's one of the most important things I teach on and it's one of the most important things we'll ever get. Two things I wanna say, heaven is a decision away. There's a whole chapter in here, it's the introduction about how heaven is a decision away. And we hear that and we think that's right, I need to decide to say yes to Jesus, and you do. But then everything of heaven is a decision away. Am I going to decide to believe that even though I haven't seen it manifest yet, I've been healed by the finished work of the cross? Last year, 13 months ago, my wife was, diagnosed isn't the right word, discovered a very large, very aggressive tumor and form of cancer. It was causing her all sorts of pain, all sorts of discomfort. The day I remember most clearly was number one when we found out about it, um, but then that we found out about it because they were gonna do a scan, but they couldn't get the camera very far into the area, let's say, because the tumor was so large, it completely blocked the camera's ability to go there. So we not only had the diagnosis, we came home with a picture of this thing, and it was big, and it was nasty, and it was gross, and it was ugly, and it looked like it came from exactly where it came from, the pit of hell. And it rocked us for a couple days. And then one day, one morning, I think it was either the second or third morning, I remember trying to pray, and all I could see was that thing. 
And all I could see was how big it was and how aggressive it was and how advanced it was. And all I could think about was, God, I can't even imagine life without my wife. And the Lord spoke to me and said, then don't. And it wasn't dismissive. It wasn't hard hearted. It was her father who loves her way more than I do simply saying, don't meditate on that. Meditate on my word. Focus on my word. Fill your mind with my word. And I did over and over and over again. And then I got a decree of three pages of decrees of healing scriptures that cancer must bow. And I prayed and I prayed and I got my power packed friends who love my wife too on the phone and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and the next time I took her into the hospital it was at 3.15 in the morning because she was screaming in agonizing pain. I had a decision to make. I certainly wasn't going to deny the situation. I rushed her to the emergency room at 3.15 in the morning or 3.30 in the morning, early in the morning. But as she's in the emergency room, I had a decision to make. My flesh wanted to cry out and the enemy was poking me. Your prayers aren't working. And I had to make a decision. The word of God never returns void. It accomplishes all that it is sent to do. It always bears fruit. I will declare the word again and again and again. And I'd love to tell you that from that moment on, I was Johnny, super Christian, filled with faith. I had so many moments of fear and discouragement and anxiety. And then somebody in my family would need to be encouraged. And I'd think, okay, I'm going to be there for them. But every time I got really afraid, the Lord would meet me there and grace me there. And I'd think, then don't. Don't focus on the tumor. Don't focus on the diagnosis. Don't focus on things that don't seem to work. Those are just temporary facts. Facts change. The truth does not. And I will win the battle for my mind, my will, and my emotions. And I will set aside the fear. And I will fill my mind with the truth that Jesus Christ has healed my wife at the cross of Calvary. And I will fill my, my, my mouth with that decree. And I will decree it and declare it. Because one of my most favorite things to teach and make Maybe the most important revelation God has ever blessed me with is how we operate as dominion stewards in the earth. Because in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God says that's who we are and that's what we're here for. He's always wanted a people willing to be in relationship with him who would walk with him, be discipled by him, and mentored by him, and represent him, and literally re-present him to all of creation. That's what it means to take dominion. So I cried out to the Lord once and said, how? And he said, you already know. It's through the power of your will, the gift, power, and responsibility of your free will, and the substance of your faith. I love to teach on faith. There's so much great teaching on faith, but there's very little on the substance of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is not only a belief, but it's a substance. So we need to catch that. Like, these shoes that I'm wearing aren't the thought of a shoe, aren't the belief of a shoe, aren't the hope of a shoe. They are shoes actually covering my feet. Why? Because leather is a substance. Somebody created these shoes from leather, and so they exist, they're real. When we catch that our faith works the same way, then when we see the report of our circumstances that are facts... But we realize if they're facts that don't line up with the truth, then we're here to deal with them. And the way we deal with them is not to deny them, not to turn away from them. Like we talked about in the service this morning, behold darkness on the earth and deep darkness on the people. Why? So we can be aware of it and deal with it and shift it. God doesn't say hide or deny or, or turn away. He says, see it, and I'm here with you, and I'll walk with you, and I'll teach you how to deal with it because you're my plan for the hour and my solution in the earth. So what we have to catch is when we're looking at that tumor or that checkbook or that prodigal or that umpteenth argument with that cousin or whoever, the facts are that's all there. But the truth is God has a solution. And when you choose from the place of volition, from the will, the free will, you choose to believe eternal truth over those temporary circumstances, you choose to believe 
So now, through your free will, you've activated your faith, which activates the substance of your faith. And then the substance of your faith works to establish in this temporal realm that we're stewards of what is already ours in the eternal realm. But the devil just wants to say, you don't see it, do you? You don't have it, do you? And we need to say, I have it. Jesus gave it to me. It's mine. I will contend. I will believe. I will declare. And I will see the substance of my face manifested in your face devil whatever it is that's why every attack is ultimately an attack on the soul because ultimately what the enemy is after is he knows all he can do is lie so he'll lie to us and say, that's your portion, Robert. It's in your portion for two years. It was your portion for six years. It was your portion for 10 years. You've been sick for 12 years. Just accept it. No. My portion is, I am healed by his stripes. My portion is my wife's tumor must dissolve. And we contended and we declared and we believed. And last week, she was declared cancer free. And many times it looked like it was going very much in the other direction. But my wife is a champion and a warrior, and she had her moments when she was afraid. I had my moments when I was afraid. But one of the things that God highlighted to me in our journey is whenever she'd be around family, friends, or one of her patients who love her so much and was always there for her and were kind to us and loving towards us and supporting us, and we have the most amazing family and the most amazing church family, and Darren and many of you were praying and contending because your family, and we don't take that lightly because we know many go through things by themselves, and we didn't have to, and we're so faithful, so grateful for that. But one of the things God highlighted to my wife when friends or family were around, and they'd see that she was withering away before our eyes. She was getting so weak and so sick and so tiny. And she's already a lovely little Korean woman, but she became so sick and so tiny. And they'd say, I'm concerned. And in those moments, God would always use her. And she declared over and over and over again, one, one person at a time, but I heard it over and over again. She said, I'm not going out this way. And one day I said to her, honey, do you realize you're prophesying over yourself? And she said, I know I'm prophesying over myself. <laughs> Whatever battle you're in, I am not making light of it. I'm not making light of how hard it can be, how scary it can be. I'm not making light of how long it's been going on. Look, I get, I read when Paul said these light and momentary afflictions are nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that will be revealed. And I thought, dude, you have no idea. This isn't light and it has not been momentary. But what God highlighted to me, and I've read that scripture so many times, what God highlighted to me was he didn't say the glory that will be revealed. He said the weight of eternal glory. And that's when I got it. Every time we choose to believe eternal truth over temporary circumstances, the substance of our faith is activated. And what happens is what we have in the eternal realm is begin, is manifest. Like I see it like Lego blocks. Like every time I declare Lego block after Lego block after Lego block of the substance of my faith is building and establishing in this realm what I have in the eternal realm. That's what that weight of eternal glory is. The weight is the substance of our faith. That scripture is not only about if you choose to believe you're laying up rewards in heaven, you are, but it's also how you operate as a dominion steward in the earth. When you win the battle for your mind, will, and emotions, through God's grace and Every bit of glory goes to the Holy Spirit who walks with us and talks with us and meets us where we are. 
But when you choose to believe, when you choose to take authority over the thoughts of fear or anger or frustration or discouragement, you cast them down and you choose to meditate on and think about the truth of God's word and his faithfulness and goodness. I declared over and over and over again, God, you are good. When nothing looks good or feels good, you are good. Thank you that you are at work in this. Thank you that you will bring about the very best results from these current set of circumstances. I declare the fullness of your goodness into everything we are facing. And the substance of his goodness was established in a greater and greater degree. That's the weight of glory. When you win the battle for your emotions and you catch yourself entertaining fear or anger emotions, that's not a defeat. That's the first step towards victory. You're realizing, wait, this is not a divine emotion that is helping this situation. God's not mad at you. He's not chastising you. He's reminding you. He's highlighting. So he will grace you to say, Lord, I'm going to choose hope in this situation. I'm going to choose joy in this situation. Grant said something when we were praying together that blew me away. I have to unpack it. He said, hell has no plan for joy. Hell has no response to joy. I thought that's one of the truest things I've ever heard. When we choose joy, happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is a gift that we have. One last example and then I'll close because it's time to close. Most of my life, I have had the patience of a hummingbird. I have never been known as a patient man. And I tell, I tell the long version of the story, and it's actually, I laugh at myself now because it's ridiculous. But I was going through all sorts of travel challenges for several months. And I just kept trying to bind the devil and rebuke the devil. And all of a sudden, God helped me understand. He said, no, I'm shaking everything that can be shaken so the eternal kingdom will be revealed. I was like, I don't think that's working. I'm getting more impatient. You need to give me more patience. And he said, well, I can't. I've given you every bit of patience. It's part of the fruit of my spirit. You don't need more patience. You need to choose patience more often. And I will continue to give you divine setup after divine setup after divine setup, not because I'm mad at you or punishing you. I want to help you see what triggers impatience in you so you can get victory over it. Because as soon as you choose patience in those situations, I've actually seen time slow down when I've choose patience in a situation I was impatient because I was concerned about time. That's winning the battle for your mind, will, and emotions. There's so much more, but it's all in the book. That's not just an appeal to get the book. It's, it's me saying, thank you for, I didn't really even look at my notes, and I know I rambled around tonight, but this is so important. When we win the battle for our mind, will, and emotions, we will live inside the more that we've been crying out for that we already have. We will see victory in the areas where it looked and felt like we'd never have victory. We have it. I'm not saying it's easy. And again, I'll, I'll go back to what I was originally closing with and close. I'm not making light of one thing you're going through. You have no idea how much compassion I have for you. I know how hard these battles are. I know how scary they can be. I know how long they can last. But I also know from so many examples and so many stories that I don't have time to tell tonight, some are in the book, some aren't. But then we, when we refuse to deny the facts, but we deal with them from the place of knowing facts change, especially when we stand on eternal truth, and when God highlights an area where we haven't been winning the battle for our mind, will, and emotions. A couple months ago, I was sitting in my prayer chair and was trying to pray about something, and all the Lord said was, you need to read your book again. You haven't been winning the battle for your mind, will, and emotions lately. And I thought, I haven't. I didn't feel condemned. I didn't feel like he was saying, so I'm going to punish you. I felt lovingly disciplined that he was saying, I want you to live in the more you're crying out for. I've taught you how to do it, and I'm here to help you learn to do it again. I am still learning to operate in this as much as anyone, but I know that I know that I know that it works. There, nothing will defeat the devil like winning the mind, winning the battle for your mind, will, and emotions. 
It's a long title. It's a cumbersome title. I begged the publisher to call it The Victorious Soul or Revival Begins Within, but they loved this title for some reason. I don't love the title necessarily, but I absolutely love and appreciate what God mentored me in. Every single chapter ends with battle keys. So when we share the revelation that God shared with us, then there's ways to apply it at the end of the chapter. So it's not only revelation, but it's easy to activate. Stand to your feet. I've talked more than enough. Was that helpful? Thank you for your kindness. This atmosphere is so rich. It's almost hard to focus. It's so, it's so easy to be caught up by Holy Spirit. And, and I hope that was cohesive and you got something out of it. But Lord, I know you're here. And I ask you, Lord, to minister to every heart, every mind, every soul here. Lord, everything that was of you, I ask that you would take it deeper and make it truer. And anything that was my rambling, simply let it fall away, harmless and ineffective. But Lord, you have, a, you have a room full of champions here. You have a room full of warriors who are in battles. And I declare over each and every one of them that they have the victory because you've given it to us. And what I feel to declare over all of you tonight is two things. And the first is 2 Corinthians 2.14. Praise be to God who always, say always, always leads you in triumph in Christ Jesus. And I declare, Lord, that not only do they have the victory in Jesus, but you are leading them, guiding them, teaching them, walking with them, mentoring them in how to see that victory made manifest. That's the leading of God, to see what we have in the eternal realm established here in the temporal realm. And Lord, the other thing that you told me to do tonight before I came down, you said to release and impart the substance of faith that you've blessed me with. I have a, God has given me a substance of faith that I had from my early days in believing. My whole theology was, I'm going to read my Bible and believe it. That's my whole approach to my Christian walk. I begged God to let me go to some sort of Masters of Divinity school. And, and I think those are brilliant. I have no problem with those. But the Lord told me, you want your validation in a diploma and in initials. I want you to always know your validations in me and me alone. And so, Lord, I thank you that you continue to mentor me. You continue to bless me with the school of the Holy Spirit. And you continue to increase the substance of my faith. And you say to freely give what I have freely received. So in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and if you feel to, just extend your hands up into the glory realm right now. Lord, I thank you that you, you are the substance of faith. And God, you say in your word that we can actually operate in the faith of God. Not just faith in God, but the faith of God. And Lord, you've blessed me with the faith of God that spirit of faith, that substance of faith. And Lord, what you have done for me, what you have gifted me, let my ceiling be their floor. I ask Holy Spirit that right now that you would release and you would activate the faith of God that is the substance of faith and spirit of faith that knows, that knows, that knows eternal truth is ours in Christ Jesus and a grace, 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 there it is, grace, grace, grace. Some of you are gonna feel a wind blowing across you Angels are coming to you right now, ministering to you. I'm seeing golden funnels over many of you. And there's like this oil that is faith, faith, faith pouring into you. Some of you may even get oil on your hands or gold on your, your hands or forehead. I don't know. If you get a sign, that's just God's way of saying, see, I'm doing it. If you don't get a sign, win the battle for your mind, will, and emotions. And know that everything is received, not by signs, but by faith. Signs will increase our faith, but God is increasing your faith right now. In Jesus' name, I declare it. Faith of God be released. Substance of faith be released. In Jesus' mighty name, everything that you've blessed me with, I release to every single person here. In Jesus' mighty name and to his everlasting fame, amen.